about becoming an HVAC tech or entering the HVAC space, you need to get your EPA 608 certification. This video is not going to be an all-encompassing deep dive into EPA 608. It's going to be like a cliff notes or just to give you a general idea of what the EPA 608 exam has on it and what it's all about. So EPA 608 certification is required for any technician who maintains, services, repairs, or disposes of appliances containing regulated refrigerants. So maintaining and servicing and repairing could be you got to replace a failed compressor, uh, a, a leaky condenser coil, evaporator coil, etc. Anytime you got to recover refrigerant or open up the refrigeration system, you need to have your EPA 608 certification. To clarify, EPA section 609 is for automotive HVAC. This is not the same thing as EPA section 608. So on the exam, there's 25 questions for each section. You must get 70% of the questions right to pass the exam. And most importantly, you must pass the core section to get any type of certification. So say you do great and you get all the questions right on type one, type two, and type three, but you don't pass the core, you don't get any certification. Now you can retake the exam So again, the types of certifications are type one for small appliances that are hermetically sealed in a factory with five pounds of refrigerant or less. So think about like a refrigerator, a window air conditioner, a drinking fountain. Type two would be medium pressure, high pressure and very high pressure appliances that contain more than five pounds of refrigerant or if the installation requires refrigerant charging. So if you have to install or fabricate a line set out in the field. So think like a regular split system on a house um, or your you know, rooftop units that contain more than five pounds of refrigerant, uh, package units that contain more than five pounds of refrigerant. Type three would be your low pressure appliances like chillers and then if you get your universal certification, you can work on all three of these types. So you really need to know and memorize the refrigeration cycle and the main components in a refrigeration system. So let's start with the compressor. The compressor is a heart of an HVAC system. Um, a compressor, excuse me, a compressor should only pump vapor refrigerant. You should never have liquid refrigerant going into a compressor. It can slug the compressor, damage the compressor. The compressor is the refrigerant pressure increaser. Remember there's a temperature and pressure relationship with refrigerant. So when you increase the pressure, you're going to increase the temperature. Conversely with refrigerant, when you decrease the pressure, you decrease the temperature. So leaving the compressor on the discharge line, we have a high temp, high pressure vapor going into the condenser coil outside. The condenser cooling fan is gonna dissipate that heat energy out of the condenser to the open atmosphere. Uh, the refrigerant is gonna change state about halfway through the inside of that condenser coil. Uh, and then it's gonna leave as a high pressure liquid on the liquid line going into the metering device or expansion valve where it's going to allow the refrigerant to expand and quickly reduce in pressure and temperature and it's going to leave the uh, metering device as a lower pressure uh, lower temperature liquid with some flash gas on the expansion line that goes into the evaporator coil Inside the evaporator coil, the refrigerant will change state again from a liquid 
to a vapor. It'll then leave on the suction line as a cool vapor going back to the compressor. That cool vapor refrigerant also acts like a, a coolant, if you will, to keep the compressor uh, motor windings from overheating. It, it keeps it cool as well. Now, as far as how your indoor air actually gets cooled down, your ambient warm indoor air goes through the return filter into the blower. The blower blows that warm air through the evaporator coil where the heat energy in that air, in the air molecules, is given off to the refrigerant that is flowing through the evaporator coil. The refrigerant absorbs that heat energy. Remember, because law of thermodynamics here, hot always goes to cold. So once the heat energy is given up to the refrigerant, that ambient air then is cool, leaves the evaporator coil, goes through your ductwork, out your supply registers. A few things to note. Sometimes you may see a liquid line receiver. Sometimes you might see an accumulator just before the compressor. Um, usually like on a heat pump or on different types of uh, refrigeration systems or equipment. Um, not so much on, on your regular typical residential systems. Uh, some terminology and notes. Uh, again, this is not an all-encompassing um, complete tutorial about the EPA 608 exam. It's merely like a cliff notes to get your feet wet. Um, chlorine breaks down ozone molecules, O3. Uh, two terms you want to know, ODP and GWP. Uh, refrigerant has an ozone depletion potential and a global warming potential. Uh, and then three other important terms you'll see on the exam, recover, recycle, and reclaim. When you recover refrigerant, that means you pull it out of a piece of equipment into a recovery cylinder, and then you make a repair to that equipment and put the refrigerant back into the equipment. When you recycle refrigerant, they do this a lot in the automotive space. You pull the refrigerant out of the equipment, you or the car or the whatever, and you run it through a series of inline filter dryers, and then you put it back in that equipment. Reclaiming refrigerant means you pull it out of a piece of equipment and you send the refrigerant back to a factory or a facility that is authorized to process that refrigerant and clean it up and make it pure enough to sell to, to virgin refrigerant standards. The Montreal Protocol was a treaty designed to protect the ozone. It went into force January 1, 1989. January 1, 1992, it became mandatory to use recovery equipment whenever pulling refrigerant out of cars. July 1, 1992, the Clean Air Act says no venting allowed except for de minimis releases. Here's another term you need to know. What is a de minimis release? Well, when you go to hook up your gauges or your hoses to a piece of equipment, to an appliance, and you get that little squirt of refrigerant, that's a de minimis release. It was unintentional, unavoidable, um, or you're recovering refrigerant from a piece of equipment and something fails and bursts. It was, again, unintentional. You didn't mean for that to happen. That is a de minimis release. What is not de minimis is if you intentionally go up to a piece of equipment and cut the refrigerant line and release that full charge of refrigerant to the atmosphere, that is illegal. That'll get you a fine. If someone sees you do that, they can even receive a reward of up to $10,000. So again, just de minimis means accidental. You made a good faith, uh, best effort to avoid allowing any refrigerant to be released into the atmosphere. Um, November 15th, 1993 requires low loss fittings on all recovery equipment. November 13th, 1994, technicians must be EPA 608 certified to handle refrigerants. December 31st, 1995, CFCs can no longer be manufactured. January 1st, 2020 was a phase out of HCFCs. 
So again, here's the ozone uh, molecule, O3. One chlorine atom can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules. There'll usually be a test question about that. And to clarify, man-made chlorine is not the same thing as swimming pool chlorine. Man-made chlorine will not rain out of the atmosphere or break down in water. So here's the Earth. Here's the troposphere. Here is the stratosphere. The stratosphere exists between the seven, excuse me, between seven and 30 mile uh, range above the troposphere. So the stratosphere is what you need to know for the EPA 608 exam. And the, usually might be a question about, you know, the miles, seven to 30 miles is where the stratosphere exists above the earth, surface of the earth. Uh, recovery cylinders. This is a recovery cylinder. It has a gray body and a yellow top. The DOT regulates recovery tanks or recovery cylinders. So a couple things to note. Um, recovery cylinders can only be filled with refrigerant to 80% full. You never want to fill it any fuller than that. Um, always store them upright. Um, they need to be tested every five years. Hydrostatic test every five years. A lot of HVAC houses will not accept rusted or badly damaged recovery cylinders. So you need to keep them in good shape. And they need to be properly labeled per DOT with what type of refrigerant is in the cylinder. But recovery cylinders are reusable, uh, but every time you go to use a recovery cylinder or buy a brand new one and use it for the first time, you wanna evacuate it down to 500 microns, make sure there's no air, no moisture, no contaminants trapped in that cylinder. You also want to know what a PT chart is. This is a PT chart. You are allowed to use a PT chart during your exam. So basically it shows the refrigerant types across the top, the temperatures down the left-hand column, and then depending on what refrigerant you're looking at and what the temperature is, you can match up and run your fingers across the column and the row to see what the pressure is. Uh, flammability and toxicity classification per ASHRAE 34. So this is another important chart to memorize. So A1 refrigerants have no flame propagation a2L refrigerants have lower flammability. A2 refrigerants have are flammable. And then A3 refrigerants are highly flammable. B refrigerants have higher toxicity. So you can kind of think of it as A is okay, B is bad. If you see any B refrigerants, they're highly toxic. And obviously if you look on this chart, a B3 refrigerant is highly toxic and highly flammable. So the higher the number, the higher the flammability. A is for lower toxicity, B is for higher toxicity. Uh, EPA evacuation level chart. So this one, uh, I got off of the HVACRschool.com. Uh, that's a great uh, source of information and training for you. Uh, HVACRschool.com. They have a lot of good material on their website. They did this really great chart. Uh, you need to kind of memorize this chart the best you can and pay particular attention to the fact that um, when they're talking about evacuation levels, for high pressure appliances, less than 200 pounds, high pressure appliances containing 200 pounds or more. 
You notice that inches of water column or inches of vacuum is different depending on if it's more than 200 pounds, less than 200 pounds. And if the recovery unit you're using was manufactured before 1993 versus after 1993. Some more key notes. Uh, if a leak rate is 500 pounds or more, inspection is required every three months. If leak rate is between 50 and 50 pounds, uh, leak rate inspection is required once a year. If the leak rate verification test records for HVACR appliances are to be kept for three years by the owner operator of the appliance. Uh, the last person in the disposal chain is required to keep records of an appliance that was disposed of for a minimum of three years. A system that has a charge of 15 pounds or more of refrigerant cannot use system dependent or passive recovery. You have to use an active recovery device. Uh, silicone elastomers, so if you have O-rings or seals, uh, may, uh, silicone elastomer seals are not compatible with HFO refrigerants. HCFCs will be phased out by 2030. HCFCs use synthetic alkabenzene oil. Uh, that's another thing to note and learn about is there's different types of oils in these refrigerants. Um, HFOs and HCs have no ODP. HCs have uh, the lowest ODP and highest GWP. I apologize for my, my typo there. Uh, azeotropic refrigerants consist of two or more components, but act like a single component across their entire temperature range. Uh, zeotropic refrigerants have different boiling points and can be a two or three part mixture called a ternary blend. Uh, all recovery equipment must meet AHRI 740 standards. Uh, the rupture disc on a low pressure chiller is set to burst at 15 PSI. That's usually a question on the EPA exam. Uh, never install relief valves in series, only in parallel, and they should be piped to the outside of a building, not to relieve. You don't want them relieving, obviously, inside the building. That would be bad. And again, that's usually a question on the EPA exam. Um, and use a municipal water supply when using a water-cooled recovery machine. So some testing facilities where you can get more in-depth information or sign up for your proctored exam. Uh, mainstream Engineering, ESCO Institute, or in person at your local HVAC supply house. Again, this YouTube video is just meant to be an overview, uh, not an all-encompassing study guide. But I do hope this information helps you. Good luck with your exam. Please like, share, subscribe, leave me a comment, and thanks for watching.